to continuously improve the care and handling of their animals. This is the first of 10 webinars that will cover various animal care topics, which are designed to help dairy farmers meet the new requirements of Farm Version 3.0. The live webinars uh, will also be recorded and hosted on the farm website for later viewing, along with the Merck Animal Health Dairy Care 365 Animal Handling Video Training Modules. The Dairy Care Initiative was designed to complement the farm program and helps producers meet farm requirements, including creating a cow care agreement, developing written standard operating procedures, and providing employee training. Today, our presenter is Dr. Ben Bartlett. He will be speaking on uh, dairy stockmanship skills. Dr. Bartlett has uh, exper extensive experience with his 50 years of raising cattle. He has seen the challenges of putting the series of animal handling into real life practice and brings his hands-on experience to the art and science of low stress cattle handling. For over 20 years, he has been teaching low stress handling techniques with a special emphasis on why it will work and why it's so important to go along with the how. He's taught producers in the Virgin Islands, Alaska, and many other large and small cattle producers throughout the country. Dr. Bartlett received his veterinarian and animal husbandry degrees from Michigan State University and retired from Michigan State as a distinguished extension educator after 34 years of working with dairy and livestock producers. Today, the Dairy Stockmanship Skills webinar is going to focus on the calm, efficient, and gentle animal handling practices that are the goal of every dairy farmer. Dr. Bartlett will cover the changes that are coming with the Farm Program 3, version 3.0, including documentation of training for all employees with animal care responsibilities and stockmanship in other areas. He will offer guidance on best practices around handling and moving cattle. And based on the established principles of animal behavior, this webinar will address efficient and humane handling of dairy cattle, flight zones, and point of balance. Humane loading and unloading and transportation will also be covered. Now, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. We um, will give everyone one more chance to access the call-in information here on the slide presented. Again, the call-in number is 1-866-852-1359, and the access code is 703-469-2372. Again, all of your lines are currently muted for anyone that has called in. Um, we're going to hold all the questions until the end of the webinar and when Dr. Bartlett completes his presentation, and we will provide instructions at that time of how to answer and ask questions. So Dr. Bartlett, I am happy to turn things over to you for your presentation. Well, good afternoon, and I'm very honored to be the first presenter here. Uh, it's been real exciting to be part of this program because I do think very strongly that uh, dairy stockmanship and low-stress handling is really uh, a vital tool that dairy producers can be uh, used and would be very useful to them. Uh, in the next 45 minutes, we are not going to cover everything. My goal really is to try to uncover some of the why and how, and my goal for this session really is for the people on this program, when you leave this program, I hope this will help you get started into low stress stock handling because it, it's a it is a process. Uh, the information is critical, but it's just you use you build on that information. So, what is low stress handling? Uh, it's teamwork, training, and time. Uh, those three elements are what's really critical to making uh, low stress handling work. Well, let's break those down. Uh, it's got to be teamwork because if it's not it won't be low stress for anybody if everybody isn't on the same page. And working with dairy farms, in particular, uh, these larger dairy farms, you've got to have the owners, the managers, and the cattle handlers, and the cattle literally all have got to be on the same page. You know, if you have a cattle handler that's out there moving cattle and the owner comes by and says, hurry up, hurry up, you got to do this faster, you know, it's just going to frustrate the cattle handler and he's going to take it out on the cattle. So everyone, it's really critical that everyone be on the same page, you have the teamwork to make this happen. So 
where there's owners, managers, the, the guys actually out there moving to Cal are critical, but they're just part of that team. Training is so vital because as humans, I think we're kind of handicapped with our verbal skills. Uh, we're used to telling people what we want to do, you know, go do this, go do that. And really, when it works with cattle, we need to look, learn about asking rather than forcing. It's kind of been the old way of working cattle. I can make you do it. We're going to ask them to do it. We need some skills and training in nonverbal communication. Uh, and low stress handling is a learned skill. Um, I like to make the analogy, it's a little like swimming. I can tell you what strokes you need to use, but I don't think after you watch a five minute video on swimming, you're ready to be dropped in the middle of the lake. You need to go practice a little bit. So, and that's where the time comes in. It takes practice to be good with it. You gotta build your trust with your livestock. You know, if you've been treating them one way for the last umpteen years, uh, you can't go out there tomorrow morning and say, okay, cattle, we're just trust us now. We're going to do this all different because, uh, trust me, they uh, they won't believe you until you actually demonstrate that. So it's that that's what low-stress cattle is all about, is what teamwork, training, and taking the time to do it. Now, I know public perception is really important, and I think the, the Farm 3.0 program, because it offers us a, a public standard of accountability and treatment, is very vital. But for the dairy farmers, I think you also need to make sure that you're not doing it just because it's a good thing to do, because low stress handling, and the research backs this up, actually is going to increase your profitability. Uh, Kate Bauer of Australia came up with uh, the uh, heifers rushed in and out of the parlor, three pounds less milk, they lost less weight. There was more incidents when you hurried them in and out of the parlor. Uh, cows handled adversely, gave less milk. This was out of the UK and Canada. Rushkin showed that production was down 10% by the presence of an aversive handler. And it, it's really interesting. When I talked to dairy farmers, that doesn't really mean anything to them. But then I asked them, have you ever been in a parlor and had somebody kind of loud and the cows don't like? And, and they say, oh, yeah, you know, the cows jump around and kick off the milking units. So they know when someone is around that they don't like. So this research just kind of verifies kind of what a lot of us really need to begin with. Well, to really make low stress handling work, you need to understand why cows act like cows. And because they're different than we are. They, anatomy, instinct, and experience. They're the way they are physically, they can't change it. Uh, instinct, they've evolved over thousands of years and it's given them certain traits that they just they can't just get rid of that easily. And experience is really critical. And this old cliche about you get one chance to make a first impression, I really want to emphasize this. And I got a little 150 and 33 down at the bottom of the screen here. And what that says is that the first time you try something, that's 100% of what you base your opinion on. You know, if you try a candy bar, a bottle of pop, or experience, and it was bad, that's all you've got to go on. After you've done it twice, then it's like, well, it's, first time was good, second time was bad. So if you go to a restaurant and the fifth time you don't get a very good meal, you might go back because the first four were great. But if the first one is bad, you're probably never going to go through that door again. So experience is, is really critical, and that first experience is, is really vital. So let's break down some of these things. Anatomy. Uh, vision is their primary alert system, and so the cow's vision, understanding it is really critical. They have uh, almost 360 degrees horizontal vision, in other words, you can see all the way around them. But depth perception takes two eyes, and most of what cattle see, they only see with one eye. You'll see a little graphic of that here in just a second. So they see a lot, but they don't have good depth perception. They don't see it well. The other thing I think is really critical, and I don't hear this talked about very often, but it's very telling about cow behavior when you understand that they only have 60 degrees of vertical vision, up and down, versus humans, which have about 140 degrees. And the best way to perceive that or actually appreciate what that's like is if you can take your hands uh, with your fingers flat and put them underneath your eyes so you can't see your feet. And then that's what a cow's vision is like. So when you wonder why cattle jump over a gutter or why they jump out of the back of a stock trailer, 
why they don't want to go downhill. Just put your hands underneath your eyes and head for a staircase. Don't do this, but just think about what that would be like to try to walk down stairs if you couldn't see where your feet were. And that's the way a cow sees it. So uh, this is really critical to why a lot of times cows do what they do. Uh, in addition to hearing, they can hear better in volume and range. They, they, they've got big ears and they can use them. They hear very well. I don't know why we holler. They hear well. Uh, but they really have, ironically, a poor ability to locate where that sound is coming from. People can do within five degrees and cattle within 30 degrees. So they don't know where sound is coming from. So the bottom line here, the message is here, they take in lots of stimulus, but they don't sort it out very well. So that's something to think about. And just think about the old classic uh, blinders on a horse. You know, there was a reason for that. Here's a picture of a cow's face, and just to remind you, see how those eyes are set way on the side so they can see uh, away from each side of the head, but they really don't see much in front of them. And here's that little graphic that just uh, it, uh, emphasizes this panoramic vision of one eye, narrow, good depth perception vision, and then a big old blind spot behind them. And so, when we're working cattle, understanding how they see is really critical because that helps us understand why they do what they do. So instinct is the second thing we need to understand about cattle. Uh, predator versus prey. How does a cow know we're going to eat them? Why is a cow afraid of a dog and they're not afraid of a horse? Why, why is that? And the cow knows because of the shapes of their eyes. Our eyes are in front of our head and they're nice and round because we have good depth perception. And so does the dog. Horse got their eyes on the side of the head. So they know they're not afraid of us when they see us, but they, by George, we better keep an eye on you because you're one of the other kind and we can't trust you. So they're going to watch you, um, but you can build up your trust so they trust you, but they know that you're a potential predator. They have safety in numbers. They want to follow their mates. Remember that depth perception thing? Think about when cows walk across the pasture, there's a cow path there. Because the first cow has to look down and see where her feet are, and everybody else just follows. They know where, um, if the first cow is okay, I don't need to look at my feet, I can just follow her. And just think about these cow paths across the field. They literally can be 100 cows, and they're all walking one path. And if there's a stick, they'll all step over it. Uh, so they really know where their feet are at, and they just follow one another. They like safety in numbers, um, and I've joked that, uh, you know, they don't, it's kind of like the old joke about you don't need to outrun the bear, you just need to outrun the person you're with, and that's their philosophy. If I'm in the middle of the group, you can be supper today. So they see first and then check out the danger. If you think about a gazelle on the African Serengeti that, see something out of the corner of her eye, and she says, well, Mabel, we ought to check this out. They're probably going to be lunch, and they're not going to contribute to the gene pool. But if they run away and then check out the danger, they're going to be around for another day. So this, we talk about animals being flighty. They're not being flighty. It's just kind of ingrained, genetically selected over thousands of years, that you flee first and then check out the danger. Uh, they prefer light over dark. They'd rather go where it's lighter uh, rather than to a, a darker area. The, uh, uh, in their world, the cows versus bulls, um, we all know that they're obviously different, but cows will protect their calves. So when you're handling a baby calf, you've got to watch out for the cow. But if you put the calf down, probably the cow won't change you. But a bull has a territory that he's protecting. So... Uh, bulls, you need to give them a lot more credence. You need to listen to bulls a lot more. And I'll show you a picture of a bull talking to you. And, and I'm pretty sure you can figure out what he's telling you. The other, I've got uh, uh, three categories here, big versus little, old versus young, old versus young, and strong versus weak. And just think about this. If, if you're going down an alley, Who's in, the, who's in the last? Who's at the end of the, the group of animals leaving? It's usually the young heifers or a cow that's lame or somebody that's, that's challenged. And you've got to remember that young heifer yesterday was up at the feed bunk, and this old cow came along and just 
beat it right in the ribs and said, you get away from there. So today you're moving these cattle and you're going to, you know, you're going to get the heifer to make the big cow go faster? I don't think so. There's no way that heifer is going to try to make that big cow go faster. She'd much rather run over you than, than try to take on that big cow again. So we've got you and the cow to think about, but you also got to realize they got their own so social structure there that they need to keep in mind and, and pay attention to, okay? Here's that bull. What do you think he's saying? You know, he's sideways to you. He's big. He's arching his neck. He says, you know, I'm bigger than you. I think you just got to leave. Uh, really funny. I had a friend of mine who was a veterinarian who is somewhat rotund, and he said, you know, the only time we, the way I got through that fence, those two bars on that fence gate was with a bull helping me. But he said, I should have. I don't blame him. He told me I was supposed to leave, and I didn't listen. So when a bull's talking to you like this, you need to listen. They're, they're trying to tell you something. So talk, the third category that we really need to appreciate is experience. And, and I think it's important. You think of cattle are just cattle. And, and really, dairy cattle, generally speaking, are different than beef because of the way they're raised. Uh, we hand raise dairy cattle, and they have a different relationship with people than, than beef cattle are raised by their mothers. And I think this is really true when we think about dairy bulls, bulls versus beef bulls, and dairy bulls being more dangerous. Uh, they did a study with some Hereford cattle, uh, Hereford bull calves. They left half of them with their mothers, and the other half they raised like you'd raise Holstein bull calves. And ironically, at 18 months, there was about one case of aggressive behavior documented on the dam-raised uh, Herford bull calves. But the ones that were raised by people, there was uh, a significant number of ag uh, aggressive signs of aggression. So part of the reason bulls, dairy bulls act the way they do is because we raise them that way. And they really need to be learned that they're cattle because when you raise them all by themselves, they're really they're kind of messed up. They don't know who they are. Uh, new is scary. Uh, cows are just, we all joke about the cow knows what stall she's in, and she walks in that same stall every day. And, you know, I laugh at the cows until I go to church and I see the same people in the same pew every Sunday. So I'm not sure cows are the only ones that are really into habits and really like things to be the same all the time. Uh, power observation skills, powerful observation skills. You know, I say they can read you like a book, and um, when my dog is laying around the house and my wife is having trouble with the computer and she starts talking to it, I can see my dog slinking off to go downstairs. He knows things aren't going well. And cattle can tell the same thing. We talk about being quiet around cattle, and it's, and it's yes, there's some of it's volume, but there's a big difference between people that are aggressively arguing with the other, each other and uh, that you feel that tension in the air versus maybe people are joking and laughing. So animals can really pick up on this, and so we need to appreciate that they're great. Uh, they really pay attention to what's going on because they have to. No one tells them what to do. They have to – they observe to see what's going on, and they remember what was the good stuff, okay? Um, and so if they've had a bad experience, they, they don't want to go back there. It takes them a long time to get over it. And that's why that first experience, again, is so critical. So we've talked about anatomy, instinct, and experience, why cows act like cows. And I've taken some time to kind of hammer this home or at least take a little bit of extra effort to emphasize these different characteristics because the cow, her actions, her the way she acts is perfectly logical to her, and it just looks dumb to us. But if we understand the cattle, you know, there's no way in one 45-minute session or one one-week session that I can tell you, here's what you do in this situation, because you always come up with these new scenarios that, you know, you get in a wreck and who knows what you're supposed to do. But if you understand why a cow thinks the way she does and what she sees and why she's reacting, uh, then it's going to be much easier for you to take the appropriate action. So you, you can't, there isn't, there is some skills you need to learn that will get you started, but then you kind of need to listen to the cow because you got two human 
uh, entities here reacting with each other, and they're going to live, work off each other. So you need to understand why cows act like cows. I want to say just one thing on facilities. Uh, and the two main points, one, they should help you handle the cattle. Uh, safe sound and don't cause injury. Uh, you know, broken boards, uh, things not just being built right, uh, slippery floors, those type of things. Facilities should help you handle cattle. And they have minimal sound and visual distraction. Again, this, when some bunch of other things are going on, it's like, uh, you know, distracts the cows from what you want them to pay attention. And probably the most two critical things of facilities are shadows and lighting and having uh, good footing. Uh, keep in mind, if a cow falls down, we'll take our gazelle on the Serengeti again. Uh, when she falls down, she's lunch. Okay, so, when, so falling down is extremely scary for a prey animal. Um, so footing is really critical. And shadows, again, because of their visibility, you can have an alley where cows are walking down and one shadow across that or a wet spot in the floor, and it, you know, it's like someone shut the gate on them. They won't go there because they don't have that depth perception to sort that out. And the second one is really kind of funny. It really is this kind of a commentary on people. It says, if it's not working, check it out. Sounds logical. Yeah, everybody can go along with that. But I don't know how many times I've been on a farm and a guy says, you know, we built this 10 years ago and they just don't go around that corner very well. And I'm thinking, okay, when will it be time to fix it? You know, if it's not working, we need to change it. And I would think a 10 year trial period would probably do it. So it sounds pretty straightforward, but you know, if something's not working even on a daily basis. I've had situations where cattle will go down an alley and I, and I try to practice what I preach and I stop and it's just, there was one shadow. I covered the window and everything worked great after that. So check it out, all right? So we talked about why cattle act like cattle, how facilities should help you. So how do we, let's talk about cow communication. This is really getting into the how to do things here. And understanding flight zone is, is probably the preeminent thing you need to think about. And it's just that personal space around the cow. When we think about the zones around, you know, when they, the, the flight, the fight, and the freeze, and that these zones are all variable due to, you know, the speed you're walking into, the angle, the conditions, previous experience, et cetera. You know, there's some range cattle that you can't get within a half a mile, and then we have some fair cows that you can't hardly move no matter what you want to do. So the zone is, is not a fixed thing for sure, uh, and it's highly variable. Think about, this is from a, uh, the flight zone in terms of a visual flight zone from the cow, but think about this flight zone in a way as from, from a verbal standpoint, from a cow, from a people standpoint. So that flight zone is like, I can hear you now, you know? Okay, I, I can hear you. And the fight zone is like, you're shouting at me, and that free zone is that you're screaming and you're scaring me to death and I don't know what to do. So. You know, if we put it on a verbal basis, maybe we can understand it a little better. But it's important that we understand this this flight zone around an animal. And this this is a classical picture on one hand, and the other hand, it's 100% wrong because it's not a circle. It's not. It varies in size, uh, et cetera. But it just gives you this idea that at some point there's a zone or a boundary where. Outside, they can't hear you, they're not going to react, and after you cross that imaginary line someplace that you have to figure out where it's at, they're going to react. And of course, they have that blind spot that we need to worry about it always. So what's cow communication? We ask with our body language, okay? If cows watch how we act, and because they don't understand English, all right, um, they understand tones and inflections and that, but they don't understand words. So they understand our body language, so we need to engage them. We get to this edge of the flight zone. And the point of balance, the angle, is determine what's going to happen. We want minimal or uh, no verbal communication. And think about this. If you have two or three people talking to you at one time, what happens to your understanding? It goes to like zero. You know, it's like, wait a minute, people. One at a time. I can't understand when you're all talking to me at once. And when you have how many times have you heard people say, 
no, I don't need the help. Let me just go get that cow all by myself. I can, I can get along better by myself. Because when you got two or three people, you literally got two or three people talking to that cow all at one time. So that's what makes it more confusing. So, and once you get them wound up and excited, um, it's going to take a while to quiet down. So you might as well just, you got some cow crawling out of a pen, jumping out, just go take a break because she's going to need a break to settle down, all right? Here's that flight zone again. The idea that uh, the point of balance right behind the shoulder, if we're behind it, the cow will move forward. If we're in front of it, the cow will move back. If we're outside of that flight zone, the cow is not going to respond to us. And as we cross that flight zone, they start to hear us. They start to respond to us. But we don't want to get any closer than necessary because as we get closer now, we're starting to shout at them. And we don't want to shout. We just want to ask real nice. So it's really amazing how you can find that point um, where you can get a cow to dance, pick up a foot, put down a foot. That's all it, all it takes. You just be on the edge of that, that flight zone. So basic handling skills, starting, moving, stopping. Move slowly into the flight zone to find that movement. Where is that spot? They start paying attention to you. And many of our pens are too small. You get a bigger pen, and they're not paying attention, and when you walk up, all of a sudden they they turn and look at you, they turn to it in the ear, okay, now you're on the edge. And so by walking a little closer, you can get them to move back out, they'll stop. So to move an animal, we walk back and forth behind them or alongside of them, and I'll show you a little graphic to explain that. And the animal will stop when you move out of that flight zone. It's like you're not talking to them anymore, they just quit paying attention to you, all right? It's, it's pretty amazing how that works. So when you think about animals in a shoot, so many times we want to get behind them and push them up. And ironically, it works so much easier to, to see the little triangle there. You, you go in front of them, away, you stay away from them, so you're kind of moving out of their flight zone. And then you move towards them and you walk by them. And as you walk towards that animal, I, I can guarantee you 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to move ahead. And when the first one moves ahead, they like to stay together. That one's going to follow, and then the next one will follow. No beating, no tail twisting. It really works slick. And then when you get back, you just kind of make that circle again, but move away. Because if you walk up behind them, they're going to turn your head, their head to look at you, and, and the feet follow the head. So you've got to have the head pointed the right way. You don't want to stand behind them because they'll turn around and look at you, and then they stop. Here's another little graphic. People walk about three mile an hour, cows walk at two mile an hour. So when we're walking behind a group of cows, it really works great to walk back and forth behind them and it accomplishes a couple of things. Number one, you're in nobody's blind spot continuously. Cows can tolerate it if you walk from one side of their blind spot to the other. It's like, okay, he was over there, now I see him over here, cool, I know where he's at. And the other thing is, if you're walking back and forth, you get to walk at three mile an hour and you're happy, and the cows are walking two mile an hour and they're happy. So everything's good, but walking just behind them and one just straight behind them, you'll tend to get too close, you'll put too much pressure on them. Remember, the ones back there are the ones that aren't going to push the ones up in front to make them go faster. So you just kind of frustrate everybody. The other little graphic on the right side of the page, uh, it really emphasizes something I think is really critical. The, the angle that you're going to intersect with this cow. Now, this our little gentleman here, this is like a freestall, and a cow in a freestall, even though she has her head through it there, you understand it. Uh, he's behind her, but if he takes a step so that that cow feels he's going to pass in front of her nose, she will back up. So when we're emptying freestalls that bring cows up to the holding pen, we don't literally need to get up in the next freestall and get in front of the shoulder. If we just make that cow think, we're going to walk by you, by the front of your nose, she will back up. If you would take that angle and make him face the shoulder, you would drive her farther into that freestall. So the angle is really critical. And this is a really good way you can walk down an alley you take the sharp left to make one step, like towards that cow's nose, and then just about guarantee that every cow, well, not every cow, but most every cow is just going to back out of the freestall. You don't need to crawl up in every freestall. You just make her think you're going there, and she'll back out. 
So little things like that, appreciating the flight zone and then these handling skills, this this body communication, tell the cow, here's what I want you to do, all right? You do it with, with, with your physical movement. So here's a little slide that talks about moving cattle in specific situations. And this is moving cows in the milk and parlor. And this is really a critical deal. This is this is collecting the income, okay? I mean, you want cows to calmly walk into the parlor and let down all their milk and that be all worked up. So moving cows in the parlor is critical. And again, using that walk against the flow, minimize any negatives coming into the parlor. Beating on them with a gate is not gonna make want cows come back up there. And it's really good to have written protocol, protocol, protocols, excuse my cold here, and uh, post them in a parlor and make sure employees are trained. Now, you probably hear me talk about training people, but it's, it's really critical. We can't expect people to know some of these things. We need to make sure they have a chance to, here's how we do this. And, and it seems like, well, they know how to milk cows, they know how to do this, and it's like, no, just spell it out, just walk through it, and it'll be good for you to say, okay, here's what I really want, and then your employees will know what you really want, and everybody will be happier with the situation, all right? Same thing with loading cattle and unloading cattle. Uh, again, make sure your caretakers are trained, you have good facilities, uh, can help you do it. Uh, it talks about uh, this comment here about minimize the directional changes for the animal. I want to make a little comment here because sometimes you can use a bud box where you walk animals in and then let them go back to load up on the trailer. And that's not a bad system because animals like to go back to where they came from. So the direct, well, the directional changes we really need to watch out for is these blind corners where the animals, you're walking them down an alley and they can't see where they can get out. So those are the kind of things we really need to, to watch out for. Um, Again, moving animals out of free stalls, walk at an angle. That that angle that you're going to do it really does work. Um, but it's going to be a new experience for everybody. So give, be patient, kind of let let people figure it out. So handling skills are a learned skill. I, I made the analogy with swimming. Uh, you know, and you you can say I know the I know how to swing my arms and kick my feet. I know all that, but I still think you need practice, and I've been at this for many years now, and um, it, it's been interesting to me. My wife and I are out there working cattle, and something doesn't go according to plan. It's like, oh, okay, I know what I did. I was in the wrong place. And it's really interesting. That is replaces replaced the why weren't you doing this or that attitude. So it's a learning skill. When something doesn't go right, you say, okay, what did I do wrong, and what did I need to do different? And then you keep practicing, all right? Keep in mind, every counter is an encounter with your livestock is a training session. Uh, you gotta earn the animal's respect. So you can't go out there and say, boy, cows, I, you know, I gotta get this done in five minutes. So we're gonna run you on here today and I'm gonna crack the whip and holler at you and just get you on the trailer real quick because I don't have time to do it. And it's like, well, they've just learned not to trust you, that you're not consistent. And so every time we work with animals, we're, we're building up that portfolio of experiences that they're gonna draw from. So we gotta be the consistent and do the same thing every time. And cattle are amazing. They can really learn to accept new and novel. And I mean, it's, it's really amazing what cattle can do sometimes. Some of the facilities they get along great in, but it takes some time, you know. Uh, one thing I've seen, and this is kind of interesting, I never even thought about it, but I've been working with some veterinary students or people that are new to working around cattle, and confidence is really critical. If you walk up to that cow and you are sure she might have you for lunch, boy, she could figure that out right now. So I'm not saying you shouldn't respect their size, especially when you're working around bulls, uh, but confidence is critical. You can't go in there tepidly or the animals pick that up. They, again, they know what's going on and you gotta be consistent in what you're doing things. And again, make sure all your employees are trained to uh, uh, know what's the right way to do things. So we're not teaching our cows tricks, all right? This is not a session on teaching your cows stuff. 
But we are teaching them to trust us, and when they're teaching them to accept new things, uh, you know, a heifer being milked for the first time, calves moving them, you know, we want them to act like cattle, not pets, um, not to be afraid, run on the panic when we're there, but they do need to respect and trust us. And quite frankly, the cattle that I find most challenging to work with is that fair heifer that's been raised by uh, one of the family and did everything but sleep in the bed in the house and just a super pet. She has no respect for you. She has no flight zone, and she's probably one of the more dangerous animals around, and it's really the hardest one to work with. So we don't want our cattle to be pets, we, but we don't want them to be panicky and afraid of us either. We just want them to respect and trust us, and you do that by starting out with some, here's some cattle exercises for you to build that trust with your cattle. Uh, start with the calves, most important. Take them a walk. You know, many of these calves are raised in pens and they never get outside and do anything. Let them, let them out and out. Let them run around and move them from one end to the other. Move them from one end to the other and then put them back in and feed them. And they say, oh, that was cool. You know, I got to run around and then I got something to eat. And now, so going somewhere, being handled is a positive experience. And let them see what they're going to run into in the long, long term, okay? Uh, teaching heifers to milk. Just a quick comment on this. You hold, when a heifer comes in for the first time, you hold your hand on the udder up high enough where you can, you can keep it there until she quits moving around. Then you let go. And then you do it again. What you're teaching that heifer is, when you stand still, I'll take the pressure off. If you slap a milker on her and she kicks it off, what she learns is, when I kick, I get rid of that problem. What we really want to do is have her learn Gee, I can tolerate that, and if I stand still, life is life is good. So low stress dairy handling is a partnership between humans and cattle, and I think it's really important to mention that some people are are not bad people, but they're not good with cattle. I mean, they're great skid steer operators; they're just really mechanically inclined. When it comes to cattle, they just don't have the temperament. Nope. Don't, don't frustrate them, don't frustrate the cows, just get them another job. You know, they're probably great people, that's not their job. The team needs to be on the same page. Uh, this is, again, I, I started out saying this and I repeat it again because it's really critical that everybody understands that this place practices low stress handling. Sometimes we take some extra time, you know, I mean, we don't have time to move cattle up and down and down. We got all these chores to do, it's like, no, this is an important part of bringing cattle up. So when these heifers go in the parlor, it, it's not an issue. They, they don't fall down, they don't slip. Uh, and we've seen this positive response from low stress handling. Good handling can compensate for mediocre facilities. I'm not saying you can get by with junk, but, but good handling was really critical. You can't make your facilities idiot proof that any dummy could do it. It's the people need to be trained and they need some practice, and you need to document that training. You know, again, when, you, when you've got the advantage of that program, that you're part of a national program and you've got a standard out there, then just jump through the hoops, do the things you've got to do so you can say, yeah, we're part of this program. Uh, and, it, and it will help the whole industry besides giving you credit for the good job you're doing on your place. So you put in this effort, what are the results? Reduce stress and injury for people and cattle. And that, that sounds kind of a trite cliche, but it, it's really documentable. Um, it wasn't that long ago I did a session for a heifer raiser with about 4,000 head of heifers. And six months later, I was talking to the person that hosted me there, and they said, you know, the guy said that's really working. They're not seeing near the, the animals that were falling down and slipping. Uh, that's really helped the injuries that they saw on the cattle, and we're seeing less people injuries. Uh, another large farm saw a significant drop in their workers' compensation. So just from those standpoints, we're seeing increased profitability. So not only that, but you're making cattle handling enjoyable. I mean, everybody likes to come to work and do what they enjoy. And if, and if you have to fight with the cows, um, you know, when the milkers are telling the guy, hey, you're not getting the cows here fast enough in the holding parlor, you got to get them here faster, 
then again, cows aren't happy, the guy bringing up the cows isn't happy. Everybody's got to be on the same page. So you want to make it enjoyable, safer, it's going to increase your profitability. Again, with the farm program, we're going to increase our customers' confidence. And I think, the, you know, and when it all settles down, I think there's kind of a moral imperative here that we're caretakers of these animals. It's, it's our job to do a good job taking care of these animals. So I think, uh, you know, again, we kind of emphasize maybe something when we went from animal husbandry to animal science, maybe we forgot some of the husbandry part of us, that we are actually caretakers out there. So low stress handling is different. It starts with a new attitude. It's not just slow and quiet. I mean, people say, oh, yeah, we just go real slow and quiet. That's, that's all what that's all about, right? And no, it's not. I mean, I had, uh, we had raised some sheep, and when I had 500 of them coming out of the gate the other day, I was not slow and quiet because, you know, they were coming, and I need to convince them to stay where they were at. So it's a whole different deal. It, but it's a new attitude. It's knowing why animals do what they do. The practicing how to change their behavior or ask them what you want them to do. It's about being safe and stress-free for the people and the cattle. It's about building trust with your cattle, making sure everybody's on the same page. And it's about enjoying, enjoying what you're doing. I mean, life's too short to, to not enjoy getting up in the morning and going out there. And I mean, working with livestock, working outside is such a great opportunity, we ought to be able to do it so that it's win-win for everybody. And I think, again, it's going to take training, as I tried to emphasize and talk about, and I think the Dairy Care 360 Animal Handling uh, video series is, is super. I mean, what a great deal. You can stick these uh, cassettes in, you can uh, or CDs in, and you can show them to your employees. You can talk about them. New employees come in, they can go through the program. Um, I think it's great to have this. So I'll answer questions, and as the questions are coming in, my final comment is I really want to thank you for this opportunity uh, to farm and dairy care. And uh, again, my goal today was to have you make this the beginning of a low-stress handling program on your farm. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Bartlett. We will open uh, the Q&A portion of the webinar up at this moment. Um, if you go into, uh, if you're looking at your screen on the, on the right hand side of the screen, you should see a Q&A box towards the bottom right hand side of your screen. If you put in there, uh, where it says select a panelist in the ask menu. If you type your question there and make sure that all panelists are the selected drop down option and then press send, that will be the best way for you to ask questions of Dr. Bartlett. So we'll open the floor up for any questions. So Dr. Bartlett, um, on our end, we've got two questions here. Um, the first one is, can anyone be trained for excellent stockmanship, or are they some people who should just not handle dairy cattle? Well, I think, uh, as I mentioned, uh, yes, I think there's some people who, are, that's just not their natural niche. They don't have the temperament, they don't have the, the attitude to, to work with livestock. And, Again, they not, aren't necessarily bad people, uh, but they just, that's not something that they are, get a lot of enjoyment out of. I think you bring up a good point, though, and that's, uh, there are a few people out there in the world, and I did mention them, the Temple Grandins, the Bud Williams, um, Bert Smith, that are, that are really super animal handlers. They're kind of that class all by themselves. But we can't all be in that class. But most of us can learn how to do things better. So I think, you know, 90% of us, there's going to be some that are just fantastic naturally born cattle handlers. There's some that are naturally not going to be cattle handlers. But there's a whole bunch of us in the middle that can be trained to be better at what we do. Great. Thank you. The, uh, the second 
The second question here is how frequently should employees receive stockmanship training? Well, I think uh, probably to start out with, is, you know, you need to train everybody on the crew. And I would think maybe a, a three to six month, like a checkup, like how are things going? Um, take a look at indicators of success. You know, are, are we still seeing cows slipping and falling? Are we have as many down cows as we had before? So what are some of the issues? Are there some issues coming up here that aren't going away well, then we, that are related to cattle handling that we need to, to go back and look at it? Uh, but I think getting everybody trained every three to six months, you know, there might be employee turnover, uh, at least in that first year. It's like, so how's it going? Uh, is everybody, because you can, as we all know, we can kind of be trained in something and that first training, we pick it all up and then we kind of start freelancing and added some of our own techniques in there. And we need to go back and make sure uh, learning how to do it on our own is good, but we want to make sure we're not compromising what are some of the principles. So training once, check up in three to six months. If you're keeping the same staff, you know, once a year you ought to say, okay, let's talk about animal handling. Is there anything new out there? And, I, and, and um, if I can say that, keep in mind that I think what we're doing now is all new stuff. You know, we didn't, Grandpa didn't, wasn't a cow abuser. He didn't have this research and some of this new information to know that there was other ways to do it. So um, there's always going to be new things coming out here, new techniques. So I think once a year you need to do a checkup. Great, great comments there, Dr. Bartlett. Um, we've got a, another one here. Um, how, uh, it's going to be rephrased a little bit, but um, you know, I think there's there's some conversations, especially in regards to the farm program, as to what the what the best approach is um, for not only training multiple employees on a larger facility, but um, training family members or how to handle training, you know, those those part time high school employees in in the stockmanship. What what are some of the most effective uh, mechanisms that you've experienced with those smaller family sized dairies? Um, that that would be effective in in this scope. I think you know the, the the video presentations and those type of things are really great, and and I'm biased, but I like my uh, explanation of making sure people understand some of the why cows act like why. I think that base knowledge is really important. But then when I'm doing a session, what's really critical is to I mean you can know about flight zone. But until you go out there and really try it, uh, excuse me, I'm <coughs> sneezing here. Uh, until So it's the hands-on stuff. And I've literally, we've actually had a training session for my own family with nine grandkids, so we trained them all on low-stress handling. And we worked with small farms and that. And so you need that, a little bit of that basic knowledge. It could be video. It could be, uh, you know, some hands-on lecture or whatever. But get that basic knowledge of understanding cows. And then go out there and try it and practice it. And, and two or three people, it's really interesting. One of the best ways to learn is to see somebody do it wrong. Uh, when somebody moves in and a cow moves away, it's like, wow, that was cool. I, I don't know what you did, but it worked good. But when somebody does something and it doesn't work, it's like, oh, I know what they did wrong. So, and having three or four people on the fence have somebody else try something, move that cow to the other end of the pen, sort that one black. Uh, one with the black ears out of the middle of that group. How are you going to do that? Those type of things and let somebody watch and then comment and within a family. They can learn a lot that way. Great. Um, another question that we've gotten in, um, we've got about three, three more that have come in and we're happy to take additional ones um, for those of you listening in. Uh, Dr. Bartlett, do you have any recommendations for how frequently heifers should be worked with and trained to see results once they come into the milking string? A lot of it is, I, I like to see, as I mentioned in, in my session here, start out with these calves. You, you know, like you, if you're raising kids, you don't start at teenagers to teach them what yes and no mean. You start out when they're little. And I think with calves, that's kind of the same thing. We need to learn to 
that we can move them around. They're really curious. They're much more uh, willing to try things. So I'd start, you kind of build up that rapport, that trust with calves. And then as they get to heifers, ideally, if heifers can go through some facilities or see some new challenges in terms of maybe they go through the handling facility to be vaccinated or and or their feet trimmed or whatever, uh, you know, let them, let them go through those facilities and have the crew just be a little more patient, take a little more time with heifers. And then, if, you know, it kind of sounds silly, but if you, when you get them out of that, you know, if you're running heifers through to vaccinate them, let them out and put in fresh feet. Do something that ends up being a treat. And I, and I jokingly made the, the, the analogy to going to the dentist. You know, when you were a kid, you got a sucker when you got done. You don't remember what the dentist did, but you know, you remember getting that sucker all the time. And so that's kind of what you, you know, I remember these cattle remember. It wasn't a, that bad a deal. Yeah, I had to stand here and do that. But boy, I got something fresh to eat when I got out, and it was really a good deal. And so heifers, the more you can do it, you know, there's a practical time constraints here. Uh, but if they've been used to handling new, you know, you don't need to train them through that exact milking parlor if they're used to doing new things. And then they say, oh, yeah, I can adapt. I, I can figure this out. So just handle an experience, but start out with their calves. Don't wait till they're heifers. Great. Um, another question that's come in is um, we see a lot of employees getting injured by cows while opening or closing gates while moving animals. Is there, do you have any suggestions or recommendations of how to address this? Uh, depends on the particular situation. Uh, I, the first thing I'd look at is, you know, is there, is there a facility issue here where that gate's going the wrong way and, you know, you just inherently, there's no way you can open it and be safe because the gate's in from the wrong end or some particular facility thing. That's the first thing I would look at. The other thing is, is emptying pens or letting cattle out. They, the cattle should be orderly. Again, if they're if they're not stressed, I mean, cows are they believe in the law of least effort. You know, they're not going to run anywhere unless they really have to, uh, or feel stressed, or or they're really hungry, or they're really scared, or something. Cows just kind of like to mosey along. So why are those cows busting out of that pen and running over people or run, crowding the gate? Um, you know, again, maybe that kind of goes back to that low-stress handling. You know, when you stand at the gateway and you just let some of the cows out at a time and say, no, you just got to wait, get in line here, you know. And you, you can do that, again, when you're working with a the cattle. They kind of learn that this is how they're supposed to do things. And it's amazing how adaptable cattle are if that's, if that's what it is what you take to do it. So look at the situation, check out facilities first. Is there inherent design here flaw that there's no way we can do this without somebody getting hurt or being in the wrong spot? And after that, then look at why are cattle moving so fast people can't get out of the way? Great, thank you. Um, another question here. Um, and I, it's come in a few times, and this is one that I'll take, actually. So, Dr. Bartlett, you can catch your breath. Or um, The few questions have come in regarding uh, if these webinars will be offered in Spanish for your Spanish-speaking employees. Um, for the short term, we're going to get all of these uh, webinars recorded. Uh, so over the next few months, we're going to get them all completed and recorded, and we will likely have that availability um, by middle of, of 2017. So we just need to get all the content collected first, and then we'll provide that resource that way. Um, Dr. Bartlett, back to you. Uh, there's been a question that's come in. Do you know of any resources for hands-on training um, or fees for service providers uh, in the stockmanship arena? There, there are some people out there that, that do training, uh, depending on where you're at. Uh, I'm in Michigan, and I know um, Wisconsin uh, has some people that are very involved in animal handling. Um, I'd kind of go by, you know, talk to your other fellow 
dairymen and say, you know, hey, have you been getting some training? Who's out there? Uh, obviously, Merck's got connections with people. Uh, some of the other um, pharmaceutical companies have connections with people um, and sometimes are willing to sponsor trainings um, because they want, they want happy cows and happy people too. So those are probably, I'm not going to make a recommendation to any particular people, but there are other people out there, there's universities out there, um, and check with fellow producers and, and maybe pharmaceutical companies that get around a lot and know who's out there. But if, if possible, I mean, the videos are great. If you can get someone to talk you through a session, even if it's a, just a couple-hour session on farm training, I think that's really great. That gets you started. Keep in mind, it's practice, practice, practice on your own. Get on the fence with two or three friends. Do something and let them hammer you. Like, so what did I do right? What did I do wrong? And uh, that will get you a long ways down the road to some good low-stress handling. Excellent. So another one come in. Um, are there any special considerations for stockmanship training when dealing with sick, uh, injured, or downer cows? Uh, from an animal well-being standpoint, definitely downer cows uh, need to be treated uh, with respect, and there are certain protocols. You know, we don't drag them around, and um, you know, they need to be on stone boats, or they need to be managed correctly that way. From a from an animal well-being standpoint, uh, if we are talking uh, from an animal handling standpoint on sick or uh, injured animals, you bet. You, you've got an animal. Uh, I mentioned it briefly that animals like to be together because. There's less fear uh, when you've got an animal that's isolated by themselves. They feel like there's someone incapacitated. They're going to be much more unpredictable and dangerous. So they may be so sick they're not a problem, but they could be the other way. So you really want to be careful on those animals. And keep in mind the protocol for handling downer animals or animals that, you know, are not going to be recovered um, It's never good and easy to decide you need to use that something, but well, there's a lot of times you know they're not going to get better, so just suck it up and get it done because that's the right thing to do, or handle them appropriately so that uh, they can they can get well. They got out in an area where they're protected, and and it's not animal handling as much as it is proper well-being things. And I think you're going to be covered in some of your later um, webinars, which is super. Yes, that was a great teaser for for future webinars, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Bartlett. Um, w one additional question that uh, has come in, um, are there any, and it, it kind of leads off of, of one of the additional questions earlier, but are there any unique considerations that those um, with either family labor or smaller operations um, need to consider when for training and why uh, is it important on farms of any size to have that training documented? Well, the documentation is, is critical from a, from a farm standpoint, obviously. You know, you need, if you're going to be part of the program, you've got you to gotta do the things you need to do to verify that you did it. So, but I also think, uh, you know, on small family farms and, and, and it really wasn't asked this way, but I can think uh, as being, you know, the, the old guy in the place is like, no, I don't need that. I, I know how to handle cows. I've done it my whole life. And that can be an issue on some farms. Um, I think, you know, that probably you can't, you can lead them to the tank, but you can't make them drink type thing. But if you back up and, you know, just sometimes you just, as, if certain employees are not necessarily great with the livestock, maybe it's their family operations. You kind of need to work around the people, and if, if they're not willing to take the training, do the training, follow through on the training, maybe you find another job on the farm, you know. I mean, you know, give them another responsibility. Move them up the ladder, you know, or something to that effect. Um, but I, I can... Reading between the lines here, I can appreciate what you're saying, but I think documenting and training is great and because then everybody's name's got to be on the list and they all went through it, and if they're not willing to go through it, then you kind of got a little bit of a lever that 
you know, well, gee, you can't handle the cattle here because if we ever get caught, we'll be in trouble or, or whatever. So I'm not sure I'm completely answering the question, but I think I'm reading between the lines here, and that's the way I answered it. Yep, that's that's what we're looking for, I think. So, um One second while we just scroll through some of these other questions. Okay, um, one additional question, and it, it may be the last one, um, unless others come in here shortly. But um, oftentimes, farms will get either relief milkers or sometimes have uh, uh, fill-ins for uh, vacations and other purposes. Um, what, are, what are some of the most important pieces of information that um, a dairyman w would need to look for in a person, so their, their skill sets? to ensure that they have good stockmanship skills before they um, are brought on for that temporary role? So it would be great if they had on their resume that they were trained in stockmanship and they worked for the neighbor and you knew, you knew them. That would be the kind of the ideal world, which in reality is probably not anywhere close to what's going to happen. You know, you're looking for a relief milk or somebody that uh, it would be nice um, I'd have to think about maybe a questionnaire or there was maybe some things you could do a little survey with producers and ask them, um, you know, maybe these three questions would give you a little, little, little idea on how they go about solving animal handling problems, what they would do. Um, you might ask them, is it okay to hit a cow? Is it okay to shout at a cow? Or uh, Cow doesn't want to move, what are you going to do? So you might ask them some of those questions. Uh, on the other hand, I think sometimes people aren't bad people, they just don't know. And I would look at my relief milkers or my relief whatever that person happens to be and look at the job he needs to do for, he's just going in for a week and he has, he does, he does this, that, and that. There's three things, that's all he does. And there's two of them where he interacts with the cows and, you know, he brings them into the parlor, into the holding pen to be milked, and he's, you know, and does one other thing. Just when you got him, you just walk around and say, okay, here's how we bring cows into the parlor. This is the way I want it done. And here's how I want this done. You know, train him on how you want to do it. I, I don't think there's a very big pool of people out there that you could say would have trained in low-stress cattle handling on a resume. Uh, on a, especially when you're looking down at that relief type person basis. So rather than hoping you can get the right person, make sure they got maybe the right temperament and they don't, you know, hit first and ask questions later. They're willing to, to uh, you know, work with the cows. And then just those specific jobs that they have, take 10, 15 minutes and walk them through and tell them how you want it done. And I emphasize this because for all the things I've done, we had a person helping us with our operation. Um, we were working some sheep, and it's like, wow, we never told Julie how to do that. It's like, is that dumb or what? I mean, Julie's been around our place. We know Julie. Julie knows sheep, but she's never worked sheep before. Why don't we just take five minutes and tell her, here's how you can do this. You, know, you step back here, open the gate, walk over there, see how that works? Wow, that's great, she said. So just take that 10, 15 minutes to uh, introduce people to how you want it done. I think it's probably better than hoping you can find the right person that automatically knows how you want it done. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bartlett. We at this time um, are not showing any additional questions, so I'd like to thank Dr. Bartlett for his time and the Merck Animal Health team. Um, for, for coordinating this with the Farm Animal Care Program and National Milk Producers. Uh, just as a reminder, as we finish up here next week, we will have this 
webinar at uh, the same time, uh, noon Eastern Standard Time. And next week's topic will be on calf care, and it will be led by Dr. Liz Cost. And so we look forward to having you all in, uh, in the, that webinar next week. Additionally, this webinar has been recorded and will be available for review on the National Dairy Farm website under the Merck webinar tab. So please feel free to access that website um, and look there. We also have all of the farm version 3.0 materials that have been developed at this point in time. And that website is www.nationaldairyfarm.com. And additionally, if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to the farm program at dairyfarm at nmpf.org. At this time, we thank you for being with us, and we look forward to seeing everybody participate next week. Have a great rest of your week and weekend. <laughs>